This episode of Techzilla is brought to you by the Ford Focus Electric. Oh my goodness. Mobile Display Shootout, DisplayMate.com. Dr. Oh. Ray Sonera? Uh, Sonera. Sonera. Yeah. He is what I would call a broadcast and display expert extraordinaire. Mm -hmm. He has been doing this probably longer than I've been alive. And he has been hard at work testing the latest mobile devices, the display characteristics of these devices. And this time around, he's pitting the iPhone 5 versus the Galaxy S3, yeah. as well as he's also comparing it to the previous uh, Apple phone as well, the iPhone 4. And I just have to say the results he came up with are fairly clear in that Apple is doing terrific things with display devices on the mobile side. In particular, they're doing great color. And also, this is also a comparison table showing some of the technology as well. And in particular, he gets into some of the differences of the different displays that he's comparing, uh, the different features. He also does something kind of nice here. He also just defines the display sizes in square inches, which I think is a little bit better than saying a diagonal measurement and a certain resolution. It, it gives you a better idea of how big these phones are or not. As far as the resolution goes, one thing to point out and the difference between what the LCD screens are currently doing versus what the OLED screen on the S3, and that's the sub-pixel uh, count. Basically, you get full subpixels. Uh, it takes one red, blue, and green subpixel right. to make a pixel, generally speaking, on your average LCD screen. If you could take a magnifying glass and look at white, you would see it's actually a little red dot, a little blue dot, and a little green dot. Uh -huh. What Samsung's doing with the S3 is actually something kind of interesting. They've, they've reduced the number of red and blue subpixels, well, to save costs in manufacturing, number one, probably. But it, it introduces some potentially issues with uh, basically detail and how, how precise it can be in terms of displaying, uh, especially with color pictures or text even. Is it going to be as sharp as a display that has the full subpixel count? Right. And that was something somebody brought up. And as such, it could require you put the display back a little bit further if you're actually reading it. Also, it gets into color and, and what color can be reproduced on the display. And this is showing essentially, I show this a lot with HDTVs, but the black triangle represents the color gamut of high definition TV. And you can see the red and the yellow triangles representing the Apple devices flowing fairly close to where that triangle is and incorporating those colors. The previous iPhone, which is the blue triangle, is actually a little skewed and not covering the gamut as well. But the blue line in particular, this is showing the oversaturated nature of an OLED display or how saturated it can be, how rich the colors can be. And the problem you run into, and that's what this chart gets into a little bit, if the gamut's too small, it's not good because you're not reproducing all the colors possible. Apple with their latest iPhone is apparently doing it quite right, almost a perfect match as well as the new iPad too. But if you take it too far, if the gamut's too large, that can be worse than being too small because color reproduction becomes more noticeable. Uh, red pops too much and that is just a or or green is too intense the colors just look cartoony and that's what you're trying to avoid right but throughout this article one thing that kind of stood out was uh, the test methodology basically the galaxy s3's oled display has some very hdtv like picture settings including screen modes like dynamic standard natural and movie did he get a chance to adjust those no and i asked him why uh, and dr Sonera basically came back and said i had access to the u.s version of the phone that didn't include that display control so all of you running the international version of the galaxy s3 you have a picture control that us here in the U.S. don't have unless we're rooting our phones and tweaking it. So <laughs> I would hopefully, hopefully he'll be able to go back and retest it to see if the gamut can be a little bit closer. But he also just wanted to point out too that if you're buying Apple devices at this point, you're buying a very well calibrated display. Right. And he's now hoping that Apple puts that TV out. Just so we can have a, a TV that's that well calibrated from the factory. There's also battery reasons why you would want a well calibrated display, especially with OLED devices that it gets into in the article. But also, just just if you're going to share pictures with other people, especially in the iOS world, it's nice that you have that calibrated display because what you're looking at when you put that onto a, well, someday an Apple TV or you're going to have your folks or whoever look at it on an iPad, it's going to look pretty similar to what you were looking at. And that's that's a nice thing to have it's nowadays. A good thing. Yeah. Color accuracy. Consistency. Good. Look what I found at the checkout I, line I, at the supermarket. I'm eyeballing that. Maybe what you can find at 11 o'clock at night if you look closely and ignore the candy. With must, much lust in my heart right there. I'm so excited. I haven't seen it. Well, neither have I. You should come over. Movie night. I also need to catch up on Iron Man, too. Oh, I'll take care of that, too. Way behind. Let's take a moment to thank one of our sponsors. I want to thank Ford for sponsoring Techzilla this week. Today, we're excited to spend some time with the Ford Focus Electric. Two of the features I found the most useful driving the Ford Focus Electric are the brake coach and the budget gauge. The brake coach teaches you the best way to decelerate the car 
How's it do that? Regenerative braking and the meter on the dashboard. The budget gauge is really simple. Keep the white line on top of the blue cup, you're gonna maximize your battery life and get the most range out of the vehicle. It's pretty cool. Fuel efficiency is just the beginning of the tech story inside the Ford Focus Electric. Turn into future episodes to learn more. I want to thank Ford again for sponsoring Techzilla and for their commitment to technology. Hey, it's time to get our HD Nation on. We often talk about wall mounting an HD TV. It's one of the best ways of securing a high definition television in your home. And it allows you to ditch that base stand to make that flat panel TV look even flatter. What should you look for though when you're selecting an HDTV wall mount? Well, one of the first things you want to consider is the motion of the mount. Uh, a mount that allows the display to tilt, particularly tilting up or down. Uh, it helps ensure good picture quality by minimizing the viewing angle of the display surface to where you're sitting in the room. I wouldn't buy any wall mount that doesn't provide at least the tilt control, just being able to tilt that down. Also, mounts that offer a few degrees of rotation are ideal for securing uh, a mounted TV and ensuring that it's perfectly level. Uh, there's nothing worse than getting that wall mount secured, getting the TV mounted, and realizing the whole thing's a little crooked. Most of your better mounts are gonna provide a few degrees of rotation, which is great. So once you figure out what type of motion you want uh, from that wall mount, consider how much weight that wall mount's gonna support, actually. Uh, we're looking at hanging a 65-inch plasma, and it weighs in without the stand at about 95 pounds, and I need to basically ensure that whatever I buy can easily handle that weight. Uh, European standards call for whatever the mount is to support four times that weight, so keep that in the back of your mind. Right. Where you go to look for these things? Lots of places. Monoprice, one great low-cost source we often talk about. Well, guess what? They have a whole selection of wall mounts starting at, I think that says $5. I don't know. <laughs> Maybe that's a, that could be a speaker mount, actually. But you have affordable options starting in the $20 range on up, depending on the size of the screen you're dealing with also. Do you need tilt? Do you need just slap it on the wall flat? Do you need full motion? Those options are there as well. Uh, also, Amazon and your other online sources, too. Another great source for looking at different options and the prices involved. I've used several of these on this page, actually, and pretty much anything with a four-star review or better, I'm going to say, is probably worth considering. Mm -hmm. uh, generally speaking, you're going to see that pricing is all over the place and yeah. that the more expensive mounts usually are better crafted. Yeah, these are, we should point out though, these are pretty much brute force devices. Figure out the weight, and I would just go with the shipping weight rather than the actual weight of your HDTV. Give yourself an extra bit of room. If you're if you're looking at your 47 inch HDTV and it's 39 pounds and the mount says it'll support 42 pounds and it's an extra 20 bucks for the bigger mount, you might want to just go with the bigger yeah. mount, especially if you're doing something where it's going to be pulled out from the wall, you know, and you're going to be swinging it in different directions totally. so you can see it from over this part of the room or you can point it towards the the dining room, go to overkill, properly mount them, and you know, measure twice, cut once. Make sure you securely mount these because that's what we're going to get into coming up next yeah. is actually <laughs> selecting the location and eventually even show you getting that TV mounted and some yeah. of the, the, the management issues with that. For right now, though, get a big mount. <laughs> You, you can go overkill and it's not going to hurt it. But there are some great mounts out there. One that we're going to go with for what we needed, uh, basically we're going to go with something from Sanus, a great company that makes a lot of high definition TV furniture and wall mounts. Here's a brand new product from them. This is actually a super slim mount so that when it's fully against the wall, it's only sticking out, I believe, just an inch, inch and a quarter, mm -hmm. uh, a little under an inch and a quarter, or 3.12 centimeters from the wall. So. And this is full motion because we've seen like half inch, three quarter of an inch flat mounts. Totally. Where you, basically your screen is bolted to the wall and doesn't move at it all. It might give you a tilt, if anything. Might. But, but this will allow us to bring the set out, tilt it left or right, and, and hopefully, depending on how much we can bring it out, you might even be able to rotate it fully, depending on the, the, the size of the screen. I don't think we're going to get away with that with a 65-inch screen. But next time, we're going to get into how to mount the mount, and then we'll also discuss basically routing power and video feeds to that display as it's mounted. How to hide your cables? Cable hiding! Cable Make hiding. it look good. You love watching Techzilla? Please help us out. After the show, visit techzilla.com slash survey. You go to techzilla.com. What is the survey? Techzilla.com slash survey. Hit enter. We're going to fire up a survey monkey survey. Please fill out the anonymous survey and help us learn more about you, our viewers. Just surf on over to techzilla.com slash survey. Answer our survey questions. Your feedback is really important and will help us improve the show. Again, thanks for taking the time to check us out at techzilla.com and going to techzilla.com slash survey.